Hello, I am Jeffrey, and this is The Last Step. Yeah, this is uh, exciting. I actually do have a bit of nervousness, which is, which is interesting. I was just sharing with Peter downstairs that I have this all the time, but I don't realize it until I actually have to step into something, you know, expanding our comfort zone constantly here. And what a great demonstration with Anne just doing that. It was like, it was so awesome to watch her walk through that and actually share in the show. So, so yeah, when we started talking about this, that we were going to have shows and I was hugely inspired. We had a meeting and Lisa shared that, you know, what's your inspirations in this? And immediately it was this, you know, to talk about where I'd come from, you know, which was recovery. And it led me to A Course in Miracles and to this desire to live in commun a community so that I could work on my mind, you know. And yeah, I'm really excited to actually share about how I did that and, you know, what was offered along the way and who showed up, you know, as my reflections to help me do that. But uh, yeah, I guess I can give you a little bit of a, a background and where it all started for me. I was, um, yeah, it was 2013 and I was pretty much a mess. I was, uh, I was, you know, drinking heavily. I, you know, used drugs, but not continually. I would use them off and on. And, you know, my house was a disaster. People used to come over to join me in parties and they'd be like, why don't you dust? I'd be like, dust? I didn't see it. It was like there was an inch of dust on everything in my house because I just never cleaned or, you know, and this is what my state of mind was at the time. And I shared this with Suzanne, actually. My There's Gotta Be a Better Way came a few months before I actually surrendered to a recovery program, a 12-step program. I was in Maine at my cabin, and this was the place I went for my escape, for my peace. And it's just beautiful, you know, no power leave the phones behind out in the middle of nowhere. And I went with my cousin, Rich, and we were out there and we're fishing. And I used to love to fish. And we're out in the boat one morning and it's like the morning time where the mist is coming off. And it's like, and I hook into this like five pound fish and I'm so psyched. I'm like, and it comes up to the edge of the boat and I reach down and I lip it and I pull it up. And like all this pride, I look at him I'm like, and he looks at me and he goes, I don't want to say a swear, but he swears. And I'm like, all of a sudden, everything inside my body drained out. I went, I just didn't understand. Like, here's someone who, like, he'd known me since I was born. And I thought, you know, we thought we loved each other. And we thought all these things. But there was still this deep competition. And it was like this. And it stole everything. This external stole everything from that moment. I put the fish back in the water. And I looked down, like, I really wish, for the first time ever, I wish you had caught it. And I never picked up a pole again. I set it down for the rest of the week. He's like, you're not going to fish. I'm like, no, nah, I'm done with it. You know, I wasn't done with the rest of the stuff, but there was something different in my mind. It was like, there's something wrong with the world. I always knew there was, but I didn't know what it was, you know? So then it was a couple months later, I was asked to coach a lacrosse team and they actually asked me to coach a bunch of young kids. And it was my joy at the time. And they said, you have to stop drinking. And I was like, what, what do you mean? Like, I didn't even know they knew that I drank so much. And so I said, okay, I'll do it. And so I was going to quit for the millionth time as many alcoholics do. And so it was December of 2013. And I told my father I was going to do this. Finally, you know, he used to offer me money every year. I'll give you 10 grand if you can quit for a year. I'd say, okay, no problem. I'd quit for three months and say, see, I don't need to drink. And then I start drinking again, you know, the deceived mind. And so I tried it. And when I tried it, I couldn't do it. You know, I was working and just the pressure, seeming pressure would come on and I'd my car would drive back to the store and I'd start drinking again. So my father was actually the one that 12 stepped me. He came to my house one night and he uh, walked in. He said, you said you were going to, you're going to do this. Uh, you need to get some help. And I said, uh, I said, okay. For the first time in my life, I said, okay, I'll, I'll take help. And that night I actually convinced him and my mother, I said, I'll do it after the holidays because it was three days or five days before Christmas. And I said, I'll do it after the holidays because uh, Ace is coming home and, you know, I got New Year's. I said, I'll go in and get this help after the holidays. And he was like, okay, no problem. So that night was the first night I ever heard guidance that didn't come from this steady stream of bullshit that I pretty much thought was me. And that night I was sitting there and <clears throat> I was going to call a guy to ask him where, where to go. Like, where do people go to get help in this, you know, recovery world? And as I called him, I was about to say, you know, I'm going to go after the holidays. And I heard loud and clear, you'll go tomorrow. And I was like, 
And it scared me actually. It was this firm voice. And I was like, well, that can't be spirit talking to me like that or whatever it was. But at the time I didn't know. So I did, I ended up going the next day and I went into a, a recovery facility in Connecticut and I picked up the, the big book, you know, I went in for alcohol. So I picked up the big book for the first time and I just chipped a little piece of my ego off of the door because I was willing to listen for the first time in my life. And I went in there and I read the book. They gave me the book. Of course, I thought I'd be out of there in two weeks, you know, and I read the book. And when I read the book and, the, you know, the way the steps were written, I was like, everything was resonating with me. And I was like, oh, my God, this is going to change my life. The first night there, I, was, I read the book, almost all of it the first night, and I went to sleep and I had these dreams. I don't think I've ever told him, but I wet my bed the first night. I was like, and I woke up, I didn't know why, but it was, there was so much fear in my mind and that was ready to come up and I'd never done that before. So I was like totally disillusioned and I was like, so anyway, the next day I <clears throat> read the rest of the book and throughout the first two weeks that I was there, I actually started to listen to people. And I saw that, you know, this idea that I'm not alone. But for me, it was more of this asking for help for the first time. And, you know, for those of you that do have, you know, experience with 12 steps, the first step for me, you know, I had this, they give you a sponsor that they, they have, uh, you know, they're assigned to you. This was another time that I heard this, this voice talk to me. And it was, I got this guy, Tim, and then there was Tim. And then there was Tuan, the little cool Buddhist guy. And I got Tim and I'm like, so I went to my counselor, the other counselor. I'm like, can I switch to Tuan? Like, he's a Buddhist. He's cool. And I'm like, yeah, you can do whatever you want. And just, you know, let him know. So we went and we met in the, the mess hall. And I was waiting and we were going to do our first step work, you know, start on step one. And this guy, Tim, came up and he said, hey, you want a tea? I said, sure. And as he walked away, I'm in my mind, I'm like, all right, how am I going to tell this guy that this is a thing? And that boy said again, who are you to say he has nothing to teach you? And I was like okay. He came back and I actually told him, I said, you know, I, I shared that. I'm like, I didn't think you had anything to offer me, but I'm willing to do this. And we went through the first step and the first step is powerlessness, you know, and the spiritual principle is actually honesty. I'm being honest with myself for the first time. And my life unmanageable was the part that I didn't really have a touch on. I, I didn't know the extent of my, you know, addiction to alcohol and such, but the manage, managing my life, I thought I did because I ran a company, made a lot of money, Sure, there was an inch of dust in my house, but I was choosing to do that. I was choosing to do the things I wanted to do. So that step kind of came like, okay, I can accept that, you know, my life's unmanageable. I got a company with 50 cars. I'm the only one that can't drive company vehicles because my insurance is a wreck. You know, it's like, okay, this isn't the way life is supposed to be going. So then it was the second step, which is came to believe that a power greater than yourself can restore you to sanity. I always believed in, in something. God, I remember telling one of my best friends when I stopped believing, but there was always something there. But I didn't know the extents of my insanity. That was the part I was unaware of. I just didn't know what was going on with, with me. And it's funny because in the book, <clears throat> uh, the AA Big Book, talks about Jekyll and Hyde and where the insanity lies because it actually isn't in Hyde. It's actually in Dr. Jekyll, where the insanity lies. And when I started to see that, that I had this insanity, it started to change things for me. And so it was really the third step and the fourth step that I started to read. And I was doing this all by myself, the third and fourth step. And we got to the fourth step, which is actually, you know, the key. And it's, you know, it's courage to look within. It's actually taking the victimhood away, you know, and in programs they call it putting away the blame thrower because it's bringing the world back, but it's not causative. It's all coming from me. I didn't know any of this, but I went into this I wanted to get out of there quickly. So when I went into this fourth step meeting, there was <clears throat> four people seated there and this guy, big book, Bill teaching the, uh, the class pretty much and talking about how to work the, the fourth step about what's your resentment? What is your projection? Bringing it back to actually what's the belief, the fourth column about how, you know, what am I actually, what's my part in it? And a lot of it seems like form, but actually there's a belief that's part of it. And when I started to see this and he laid it out, I went into the room thinking I didn't resent anyone. You know, I wrote down, I resent myself and maybe my father a little. And then after about 20 minutes in the room, I was like, I resent everyone across the board. Like there's no one that I don't deeply hate at some level for something. And when I realized that, I was like, oh my God, something's got to change here. So he was walking us through this process. And when I saw that 
it was a turnaround to bring it back that no one's actually doing anything to us. A woman raised her hand and she said, well, I have an exception. And I was like, okay, this is going to be interesting. And she said, uh, I was raped. And in that moment, I was like, I, I had this knowing that she wasn't, you know, it was like this feeling like she wasn't raped. Like it didn't happen to her. Like it wasn't personal. And he was trying to explain, you know, how the step worked and just taking, you're just holding on to the resentment or the belief. But I saw it much differently in that moment. And she actually stood up and walked out and walked out of the whole facility. So I don't know whatever happened to her, but I saw myself saying that thing, resentment is going to be to refeel this over and over. I was like, what do I have that I'm holding on to? And I raised my hand. I think it might've been the first time I spoke the word Jesus in the room. I said, so the best example is Jesus. He was killed and he forgave the people. And he's like, yes. I was like, okay. So in this experience, I started to realize that it was all something in my mind that I had to look at. So that was on a Thursday. Then there was a Friday. Then the next day it was parents weekend and my parents came in and they came in for parents weekend and they actually have this, you know, pretty much an all day affair where the lady that runs the whole place, Janine, talks about what alcoholism and addiction is. And I sat there not knowing that the course that, that day was for me. I was like, oh, they're going to explain it to my parents. And when they started to explain it, because I always had this idea that I was an addict like I was become addicted to drugs. So I couldn't do that. But alcohol, I could start, I could stop. I didn't have to drink. I wasn't a brown bagger on the corner. I wasn't this hopeless case. You know, that was the thought I had. But when she started to talk about the similarities and what actually goes on, and she went into environmental factors and all the stuff of the world, biological, and maybe it's hereditary and all that. But this idea of a reward system in the brain and all that, which was great. But when she came to this one point and she actually said, Every addict and alcoholic has one thing in common. So now she's bringing the two together for me. And I'm like, what is she talking about? And she puts a slide up on the screen. And the slide is actually a guy with his hands in his lap. And it says, I'm not enough. And when I saw that, I was like, you know, I finally had let my guard down just a little. And that kind of pierced. And I was like, oh, my God, I believe that. And I've built this whole bravado, this whole life built everything up around me to protect from anyone knowing that. And it was like the moment that the shift started to occur for me. And so the rest of that day, we had a meeting at night where the speakers come in and these speakers came in and there was three of them and this guy caught up at the end and he started talking about 10, 11, and 12, which for those in the program know that those are the perseverance, spirituality, and the service steps and about living those as a constant practice and when I heard him say that, he also said one thing that I had heard earlier that day twice. And then the third time I heard it when he said, follow directions. I'd never followed a direction in my life for anything. And it was like, okay, I actually made this decision that I'm going to follow these directions that were laid out for my freedom, basically. I didn't know what it meant at the time. And from that point, just a decision in my mind, things started to happen. Like, you know, in the book, it talks about once these drastic and revolutionary proposals are accepted, the feeling is electric. And I felt that going through my body. I was like, something's going on here. And I didn't know what it was. I woke up the next day and went to the, the meeting with my parents again. And I sat between my parents this day and I held their hands and I, I could cry thinking about it. I said, everything's going to be okay. And for the first time I actually meant it. Like for some reason I thought that it was going to be okay. And like, I know, I know. And that day they, they shared about, you know, a bunch of things. And at the end, they shared about the 12 steps again. They didn't speak about it during the whole thing. And then when they read them and they read the steps throughout and they got to the 12th step and the 12th step is purpose. That's what it is. It's a service step. And when she read it, continued to practice these principles in all our affairs. And I heard practice. That was the main word I heard and all my affairs and then carry this message as soon as she read it, the top of my head, I had this experience where just everything just rushed out of me. And I cried. I cried. And I turned to my mother and I said, Mom, God's real. She said, I know, I know. I said, no, if you knew, you'd never worry. You know, and I was like, I turned to my father. I said, I won't be coming back to work. I worked for my father for 20 years. And I said, I won't be coming back. And he was like, yeah, stay as long as you want. And I walked up to the lady that was, you know, 
giving the talk and I told her, I said, I need to speak with you Monday. And she said, yeah, she could see that a shift had happened and, you know, things had cleared up. And I walked around for that night and that was my Eckhart Tolle little experience where everything I looked at, it was snowing out too. It was so great. I walked outside and it was like, I had no reference for anything. You know, this idea of, you know, having that whole experience and seeing that it was all me. And then the day before was this idea of, I, I thought I always had a choice in what I was doing. And this whole day too, there was this idea that I wasn't actually choosing. And that hit me like a two by four. And when it hit me, it was like, I wasn't choosing to do all these things I thought I did. And then the question came, maybe I'm not choosing any of it, like anything that I'm doing. And when I questioned that, this experience just started and the rest of the day I walked around and it was just, it was amazing. It's hard to explain that experience, you know? <clears throat> and that night we had a movie. I went and watched most of the movie. I went back to my room. When I sat in my room on the edge of the couch, I mean, I was like vibrating at this whatever. And it was like, I handed over, I did the third step. I didn't realize what I was doing at the moment, but I did this, this deep surrender, you know, and it was, this was my infinite patience produces immediate results moment. It was like, I was supposed to go to my best friend's wedding. And I said, if you'd have me stay here and miss Ace's wedding, I'll do it. So be it. And I said, you know, whatever you'll have me be, so be it. If you want me to give up my life for these people, so be it. And when I said that, my experience was just, it felt like it came from my chest and just, it opened up. And this was, I didn't know until I read The Course of Miracles that it was called Revelation. I knew it was an experience of God, but I didn't know much of what happened there. And from that moment, I can't tell how long it lasted. You know, there's no way to describe it. It's all personal. And when I came back to the room and I was there and it was like, I felt this like 10 times even more lifted than I was before. And this glowing light in the room and it was just like it was unbelievable and there was experiences in the book bill's experience and the atheist experience that i could relate it to that okay this has happened to people i repeated to myself all night no doubt no doubt because i knew that my mind would come back and start doubting everything that is actually happening to me so throughout the next week i actually had this this experience of pretty much the ego coming back into my mind all these beliefs coming back and it was terrifying. I went through disassociation, schizophrenia. It happened quickly. It was like I heard voices. And I went to the medical people at the place. I'm like, listen, this is what's going on with me. I know it's bullshit, but I, it's scaring me. And so it lasted, you know, the good period to this. It lasted about five days. I went to a hospital. And like Layla, I was strapped down. And it looked violent because I was fighting. And the doctor said the next morning, a few times you sat up and you did the serenity prayer. And I would just sit up and I did it. And in the morning I woke and it was like, none of it had happened. And he goes, we're going to call it a bipolar uh, manic episode, but we've never seen it like that. Fortunately, I had the book to look at and say, no, it happened exactly as these steps laid out. And in the third step, when honestly and humbly made this submission, a great effect is felt at once. And I felt that. So then a whole bunch of other things happened where, oh, you should be on drugs and this. And I wouldn't really take them. I took them for a couple of weeks, but it wasn't, I didn't like the way they make me feel and all this, but I knew from that moment that I had to change everything about my life. And I had the thought of community at that time. I started looking it up online. I didn't know where to look or what to look for, but I knew the recovery center I was in was built in this way to deconstruct the ego. It was like everyone had their, their job to do. You had meetings you'd go to and share your thoughts and then you'd study a book. And I was like, literally a list of movies you're, you could only watch. And I was like, I have to find a way to do this. I can't stay here forever. So it wasn't for another year that I actually found that, which is I'm here now. But yeah, so my path was to listen and follow from the beginning. And I went to my first meeting. I walked in and I found a sponsor. And I said, I'll listen to everything you say. Because I knew I couldn't trust that, <clears throat> that mind that was talking to me ever again. And I started listening to this guy and he actually had me do a pretty, few pretty crazy things at the beginning. It was, okay, so stay at your parents' house for six months. I was like, dude, I do not need to do that, but I'll do it. The only thing I wouldn't do was go back to work. He went and he said, you're crazy to let go of your job and all that. And I said, that's not my calling. Like, there's something else that I need to go. And then over the next year, everything that I've ever wanted was presented to me. Produce a movie, be the producer, 
will pay for everything. All these things, relationships came towards me, all this stuff, all the things that I used to love to do, play hockey, never fished again, any of that. I went out to play hockey and I was pretty stubborn about letting that go because I really thought I loved it out there. And it was pretty much an egoic pursuit out there when I realized I was out there and it didn't bring me joy anymore. I actually let that go. And that was probably the hardest thing I let go of. But over this next year, it was just these, this understanding that none of the things of the world are going to make me happy. And then it was probably almost a year to the day that a guy walked into the room of, uh, of the program I was in and I felt an immediate attraction to this guy. He had just gotten out of prison that day, spent six years in prison in California and I was drawn to him. I walked up to him and said, my name's Jeff. And we started talking and Hey, let's get together for a coffee. We were going to get together for coffee and read Emmett Fox's sermon on the Mount. I went home that day and I opened up my computer for the time I looked for a course of miracles on my computer. He called me five minutes later and said, Hey, you ever read a course of miracles? I said, but I'm looking for a group right now. He's like, there's not a lot around here. Let's start our own. So we got together with two lawn chairs and the book and sat by the Salmon River in Connecticut and started reading the book together. We ended up starting a group, but this was my introduction to it. So it was only a matter of three weeks after that, that I had this, you know, this prayer. And it was, it was always my prayer of, you know, take me all the way. And three weeks later, well, he actually told me right away, you need to read Gary Renard's book. So I got sick, you know, this flu-like symptoms, which led me home for a week. And I read all Gary's books. And then I looked online and Gary was coming to Manhattan. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go see him. And I called and I got into the conference. This was in Manhattan three years ago. And I went there and I got there and I got out of the elevator. I was looking around and I was like, oh, wow. This is, this is where I'm supposed to be. I know it. Tuan the sponsor guy that I wanted to have. And I went with Tim, walked out of the elevator. And I was like, Tuan, what are you doing here? I'm like, I thought you were Buddhist. He's like, no, man, I love the Course of Miracles. So we connected and it was like this symbol of, yep, keep going. And that night I heard David talk, David Hoffmeister. And I was sitting next to this girl, Melissa, and she's like, you need to speak to David Hoffmeister. I didn't speak to him at the... Uh, at the conference, I waited till it was over and I had his number and I called him as he was driving and he invited me out to Ohio. I couldn't make it straight away and he was going to Mallorca. And then when he came back, I said, as soon as you're back, the first event you have, I'm coming to. So it was the monastery that you've probably seen the videos between shows. I went out to the monastery for the first time in September of that year. And as soon as I walked, I didn't know what I was getting into. I didn't know what Living Miracles did. I knew that there was a community aspect to it. I didn't know how it worked, but I knew something was calling me there. And I went to the monastery and when I stepped out into the, there's a spot we call the love's nest. And when I stepped there, my heart swirled so deeply that I was terrified. I was like, whoa, I was trying to hold it back. I'm like, whoa, let's save that for another day. Like, but so much emotion in this, this knowing. And then, then I was surrounded by these people that devoted their life. And I was like, ever since I got into recovery, I would tell people, you don't understand the experience I have. You can live there. Like we don't need to, to do all this stuff. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come back to reality, do this. You got to have a job. And I was like, I refuse to believe it. And now I found people that actually do it. And I'm like, okay, I'm in. And then, you know, I had to leave there shortly after because I had to go back and take care of some things. But it was like, my prayer had been answered. You know, I tattooed on my back that I will be done. <clears throat> and now I live in a community where we practice the rules for decision. Our daily practice is like not making decisions ourselves so that I don't have to live in that guilt. And it's like, I look back and it's just actually amazing to me that it happened so quickly and that I get to sit here today and talk to you guys about it. You know, I, uh, I had a hard time letting go of recovery, even when people would talk to me, oh, you have a lot of sponsees and all this. I'd be like, I'm actually concerned with, with my mind. And when I started to hear these guys talk, you know, and I was, I was introduced to Jason and Kirsten, you know, pretty much straight away when I got to the monastery. And I was like, I saw their eyes, basically, it was the first thing I saw. And I was like, okay, these people have, so it's the same thing as recovery. These people have something I want. What do they have? They have a devotion to let go of everything like every belief in your mind 
Like, where am I going to find that? Like, I couldn't not follow this. And it took me some more time to actually come fully. It was another six months that I went home and then came to Mexico. And then from that point, it was just, yeah, letting go of everything else to drive towards the monastery. And yeah, I basically wanted to have this show to share, you know, all the parables that happened to me in between, you know, actually have people on the show that are in recovery or want to make the next step. I have a friend, Frank, who is going to be on the show that he's moving down here. He bought a house. He came to our uh, adventure into the heart of awakening retreat and he experienced the same type of thing. And he got in touch with some deep beliefs that he had and had some huge healing. And now he bought a home and he's coming down here to devote to this, to this purpose. And yeah, I didn't know what I was going to say when I came on here and it's like, yeah. Yeah. I guess the, uh, the message for my show is like this idea that we can take this journey from victim to savior, you know, like, I'm the savior of the world. Like the hardest thing I read when I read that the first time, it was like, okay, I have to accept that. And it's like, I keep reading over and over the responsibility for sight because whenever my mind, and I'm in a place now that it's not even, I can't allow myself to do that because it's not supported. That's the problem I had with recovery is I didn't have a group of people that, you know, were truly, you know, empathetic. It was like, there was this false empathy all the time. Like, oh yeah, you got this or this. There's nothing like that you know, in, in my life now. And I owe it to, you know, the people I'm around, like I'm on, (laughs) I'm on the shoulders. Like I say this all the time, I'm on the shoulders of giants. Like, (sighs) this girl said to me once I walked into a chiropractor and I filled out uh, this form, like, who referred you? And I wrote God and I handed it to her and she read it and she looked back and she goes, Oh my God, I love this. <laughs> She's like, you don't have any idea the people you're going to attract. And I was like, Oh yeah, yeah, I do. No, I didn't know. I really didn't know at all, you know? <clears throat> and it's like in recovery, we talk about, tell us what it was like, what happened and what it's like now. And the, what it's like now is, why is God the most important thing in my life? And Lisa speaks all the time. And she, she basically talks about the same thing every time she speaks and every time I can't stop listening to it. And it's always about God and why it's the most important thing in her life. And it's like, that's what I did in recovery to get here. And it's like, yeah, so I guess that's what my show is gonna be about. Uh, I didn't really know for sure what it would look like or, you know, who I would have on, but I'm going to be open to questions. Like if you have problems, even in recovery or making the transition and all that stuff, it's like, that's what I'm here for. Or at least I think so, you know, but uh, yeah, I just guess, uh, I don't even know. Oh, we're at the top of the half hour. (laughs) I do have, uh, I do have a special guest here with me today that, uh, yeah, I had a dream when I was in, uh, when I was in, it was two years ago, I was in at the South by Southwest conference and I was there for movies and different things. And I had a dream one night and I woke up from it. And the dream was I was sitting in this, this circle and it was like, kind of like there was a fire out in the middle, but it wasn't a fire. It was like this glowing orb. And then from the glowing orb, there was this like little strip of black whale. I came right down next to me and David was sitting right next to me in the dream and Ricky was playing her guitar and I was looking and I turned to David and I said, I'm scared. And the fire started on the oil and it started going towards the center. And he said, don't be scared. Just stand up when I stand up. And as soon as the thing hit the center, he he was standing up and I stood up and I had this experience in my dreams where it was like, like this huge expansion, like popping out of all this, these illusions. And I woke up, it like brought me out of my sleep. And I was like, I immediately called Jason. I was like, Jason, I had a dream about David. I think I'm supposed to come to Mexico. I was supposed to be in Austin for two weeks. And he's like, all right, let me, uh, let me talk with, uh, it was Ricky. And I think Emily at the time that were there, maybe Kirsten and they had a little joining and then called me back. And it's like, yeah, come on down for a week. And that was the start of my reemergence into community. <sighs> 
<laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, we were lucky enough to have David stop by, so I thought maybe we could uh, show them all to you guys today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dream yeah, that's what he said. That's actually what he said when I, I, I sent him an email about the dream too. And I said, I said, David, I had a dream and I explained it all to him. He goes, oh, I'm so glad the, uh, the David character made an appearance in your dream. I was like, this guy's great. <laughs> you know, I heard David always when he spoke, it was, you know, I actually said this to a few people in recovery that the serenity prayer is, you know, give me the serenity to accept the things I can't not change. And I was like, that's everything the courage to change the things I can, my mind, and then the wisdom spirit to know the difference. And I, when I heard David say that, I was like, yeah, this is, this is my, this is my man, mm. you know? So anyways, so, so good to have you here today. And I thought I was going to be alone on my show. And I sat up here and Jason was here and David, and I was like, I'm never alone. Mm -hmm. And it was like such a great experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, go to wide angle. You can switch to Soren's camera. Yeah. So these these are the these are the, these are the gi these are the giants I speak of. So if you join me each week, that I can share with you how uh, how my life changed just by the surrender. So thank you so much, Peter. Back to you. 